This is the 24th webinar of the PRSA chapter webinar series. We're excited that we have a number of different chapters that are involved in our program from the St. Louis chapter of PRSA to the Kansas City chapter of PRSA, Springfield, Missouri, which is the, the southwestern Missouri, uh, Nebraska, and also southeastern Wisconsin. So we had about 47 people sign up for this webinar, so I'm really excited that uh, more people are joining us in the room. And as we move along, I know more people are going to join us. But I know this week we probably uh, missed lunch since we're doing this webinar, and uh, half of us probably have all the Halloween candy that uh, we have left over from the kids not coming to our houses. And the other half of us probably have uh, our wine from the case of wine that we bought for election night. But uh, we're excited that uh, you're, you're here with us today for a Lunch and Learn. We have with us today Jason Mudd. Um, a lot of what PRSA is, is building relationships with other people in the industry. And a lot of the people on this webinar series are people that I've interacted with personally over the last four or five years of being involved in PRSA. Um, so if you're not a member of PRSA, I do encourage you to join. Um, if you join before the end of November, there is a triple play event to where you can use that promo code and actually get involved in a section of PRSA and uh, get your chapter dues rebated back. So it's a, a great deal to have a cheaper um, reason to buy or to buy into PRSA and become a member of this professional organization. But uh, for Jason and the other three uh, presenters that we have in the next uh, three weeks, um, we're all members of what's called Counselors Academy. Those of you that uh, own your own agencies uh, can uh, actually become a member of Counselors Academy. We add a lot of advice to one another. But I want to go into Jason's uh, bio real quick because we're, I'm really excited that he's here. We become personal friends through PRSA Counselors Academy. But he's definitely a trusted advisor and dynamic strategist for some of America's most uh, trusted brands, including American Airlines, Budweiser, Dave & Buster's, H&R Block, Hilton, HP, Miller Lite, New York Life, Pizza Hut, uh, Southern Comfort, and Verizon, as well as a whole bunch of other organizations. He founded Axia Public Relations in 2002 and has become a highly uh, recognized for his passion, innovation, candor, uh, commitment, and award-winning team. I do want to say that his team at Axia actually just got um, awarded the best PR firms in America 2021 from Forbes magazine. And uh, I know I'm leaving a lot out because I met Jason the last uh, four years at Counselors Academy, but I'm gonna turn it right over to him. I do encourage you, if you have questions, please ask those in the, um, the, the chat feature or the Q&A, and uh, we will interrupt Jason as we move forward through his presentation. At the end of the presentation, if you want to say a few words, please put your name in the chat feature and we'll make you live as a presenter so you can ask your question to Jason and we can go from there. So Jason, without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you and uh, let you move forward. Thank you again for being here today. Hey, Chris, I'm really glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me and uh, thank you for that great introduction and that enthusiastic share of the Halloween candy and the wine. So. If you want to send any of that my way uh, through uh, uh, 3D printing or otherwise, uh, I'm very interested. So sounds good. Yeah, and I want to say hello to my friend Patrick McSweeney, who's on the on the call. Also, Pat, I'm glad you're here. Uh, thanks for being here, uh, and uh, thank you for all the attendees that are here today. Uh, yes, per your point, Chris, I would love it if people would ask questions. That means uh, you're paying attention, and uh, it makes it more of an exciting presentation for everyone. So. Um, Chris, unless you tell me otherwise, I'm going to jump in and start sharing my screen. Go right ahead. The floor is yours for about 45 minutes or so. All right, here we go. Stand by, everybody. Put on your seatbelts. All right, so today we're here to talk about spokesperson training and whether you are learning to be able to be a spokesperson yourself or you're going to be, uh, or I'm training the trainer and you plan on training your executives, this is going to be a great time for us to work together and um and participate. So I'm going to get started right away. Um, our job here is to help you ace your news interviews. And um, we've got several slides today to go through that. So first of all, just to keep it simple, what is news, right? Uh, so we think that uh, your story needs to be newsworthy and follow the elements of news. Um, and so uh, let's go through those 10 elements of news right now. Um, the first one is proximity. Uh, the idea is that all news is local. People are interested in the issues and events that happen close to them. 
the closer the news story hits home, the more newsworthy it is. So uh, Chris is in St. Louis. And so something happening in St. Louis is more newsworthy in St. Louis than something that's happening in, in, in Seattle to people who are in St. Louis. Very similarly, people in your industry are more interested in the news that impacts your industry than news that is impacting another industry. The second element of news is prominence. So a well-known person, place, or event resonates stronger than somebody they've never heard of. So, you know, with all respect, Beyonce here is a lot more famous than I am. And if there was a news story about Beyonce, it's probably going to make more headlines than it would about me unless my headline is super scandalous uh, or her headline is super boring. The other element of news is called timeliness. So current news has more impact uh, than something that happened yesterday or even last week. So many times my, our friends in the newsroom say, you know, if you're going to send me something that says last month this happened as a news pitch, I'm probably not going to cover it. The fourth is oddity, right? When something really strange happens, that's going to make headlines. When something typical happens, it's not going to make as many headlines. And then consequence is the fifth element of news. So when there's a, a, a pandemic and you start running out of uh, paper towels and hand sanitizers, that suddenly becomes very newsworthy. And conflict, we don't need to even think very hard about conflict that's going on right now in our country, but it's human. Jason, I think you froze up there. Well, this hasn't happened on one of our webinars. Let's all hold tight for a minute until we get Jason back. And I see Jason's back, so I'll back out. It's his show. Hi, Jason. Nice to see you. Hey, thank you, everybody, for your patience. Um, I can provide a link to the 10 elements of news that we're going through here. I personally have found value in walking through my clients with, with our clients and helping them understand those 10 news. And then anchoring each of your newsments and associating them with, with one of those 10 elements uh, and, and showing that to the executive. So in other words, if they've got 10, if you've got these 10 elements of news and you're trying to pitch them as a spokesperson or pitch a news story, uh, I would kind of draw a line in your release or in your content to which of the 10 that this applies to, to help uh, that individual really see. Uh, as we all know, right, people aren't patient. They want to hear about themselves. So you want to make them and uh, them the star of your story that you are pitching. Chris, I'm not sure where we left off. So consequence. Uh, is uh, the impact on the audience. And so, for example, the consequences of the pandemic were uh, unemployment, working home, running out of paper towels, and toilet paper. Uh, conflict, you know, we don't have to look far from the election uh, to see a lot of conflict going on in our country over the last several months. People are naturally interested in conflict. Uh, if it bleeds, it leads is an old cliche. And uh, you know, journalism is, is no, no different and our society hasn't evolved in any way that they are uh, no longer interested in consuming conflict. Uh, human interest, everything is about human interest. So you know, when's the last time you went to a movie and the, the plot was about a building or a legal entity or a corporation as opposed to the people behind it that are making great things happen. So even if you go see a movie, right? There was a movie about called The Founder, I think, that was about McDonald's. The movie was about a character and the characters around the expansion of, of McDonald's. It was not a movie about McDonald's per se. It was about the characters and the challenges and how they overcame those challenges. And then extremities, superlatives, right? The first, the biggest, the longest, the smallest, the highest uh, are all newsworthy. So the more superlatives you have, uh, the more uh, you, know, you can tie to a news story as long as it's not fluff. And then scandal, as I mentioned earlier, people love a good scandal. They love controversy. Um, and the more scandalous the headline or the story is, the more likely it'll get covered. And that's why you see things like DUIs and, and, uh, and other scandals making headlines when a celebrity is involved in those. And the final element of new, news is number 10, impact. And like we talked about earlier, that's going to be where um, you know, something happening in St. Louis or Kansas City is way more interesting to those folks than something happening uh, a world apart or a world away. And then uh, 11 things you'll never hear a news reporter say. Uh, number one is uh, your opinion is the only one I need. I have no reason to interview anyone else. Uh, hopefully and ideally, uh, good journalism is always going to interview three objective sources for each news story. We've really gotten away from that in the modern era, but uh, you know, when I was in journalism school, that was something that they taught. 
and something I think a good reporter will want to to include. I always recommend to my team that when you're pitching a story, try to hand deliver it to them with other sources um, and uh, uh, other people they can quote or other uh, studies they can uh, include. Uh, the other thing you'll never hear reporters say is, can I take you to lunch? I get a big raise um, from the story I wrote about you and your company. Uh, also, this 10 page news release just gives me a little heartburn. I hope it does you too, because uh, we should never be doing 10 page news releases. Number three is, uh, um, I hope you're coming to the meeting too. Uh, I love it when PR representatives interfere with my interviews, right? Uh, the truth is they're really looking for one expert to be there and certainly you can be in the room to capture the to-dos or the next steps uh, or to guide that uh, spokesperson with any kind of additional messaging. One time I was in a uh, TV news studio and the CEO of the company was there to get interviewed, but he brought his wife and kids uh, the client side marketing person came uh, and then uh, like two other people from the company came and it was just a big disaster, just too many people. Right. And so, you know, we had to politely ask some of those people to wait in the lobby. Um, and uh, you know, they just wanted to get kind of a tour of the studio. It was rather embarrassing if I'm being honest. Um, so yeah, let's see. Next slide. Uh, Four, uh, no, I don't need to speak to the company CEO. Any old flack will be fine. The last person most journalists want to interview is you or somebody in marketing and PR. They'd much rather speak to the company's leadership, the product engineer, or someone who has unique expertise in the space of the interview. Number five, I want to get all your company's uh, announcements. Um, can I have a copy of your company's internal newsletters? The truth is that journalists just, they don't have time and they don't have patience and they don't have interest. You know, they just want to know the parts they need to know. So again, hand delivering them a prepackaged story with just what they need to know is often ideal and preferred. Number six, I notice your company hasn't been making enough news lately. I'm following up. I'd like to do stories on your company more often. Well, unless you're Google, Tesla, Apple, or Coca-Cola, Disney World, probably not going to get this level of engagement from uh, a news reporter. So be thinking a little bit smarter um, about, uh, you know, how you can engage and stay in touch with these folks, but make sure whatever you do, however you contact them, you're either helping them or you're bringing them truly newsworthy content about your company or some combination of doing both. Number seven, take your time getting back to me. I don't have a deadline. I just thought I'd get a head start on gathering information, right? I don't think you'll ever hear reporters say that. Most of the time they're on a deadline. They're very focused on what they're working on. There are some exceptions, but that you definitely need to get back to them timely. At a minimum, let them know, here's when I can get back to you um, and, uh, and what I'm going to do in the interim. And then get back to them. Uh, you know, hold your end of the deal. Hold up your part of the bargain. Number eight, I don't want to cover, I don't want to cover your company. Feel free to go over my head and pitch my editor instead. Now, sometimes as PR practitioners, we might have to do this for good reason, but only for good reason. Uh, we have to learn how to take a no. We have to learn how to turn a no into a yes, but we also have to know never take a no from someone who can't say yes. Um, and sometimes you've got a news story that's just so good and for whatever reason, you're not hearing back from your normal point of contact that you do have to escalate it a little bit or at least inquire as to if there's a reason why you haven't been able to hear back from that person. And number nine of the things you'll never hear reporters say, um, I like to invest hours really trying to get to understand your company's long-term strategy. Look, reporters just don't have time. So you've got to be smart and brief. You've got to be clear and concise. You've got to hand deliver them what they want when they want it in a format they want it in. I had a few videos here, but in our rehearsal, we realized those aren't going to work. So I'd be happy to share those with you later, Chris, like links to the YouTube so people can watch those later. But this is an interview where uh, the person was, uh, you know, pretty smug uh, during the session, and it just did not work out really well. So uh, we'll share that with you all later. Oh. And then number 10, uh, have you spoken to other media outlets about this story? I think you should because this, new, this is the news they cover too. So I can kind of count on my hands or two hands the occasions that this has happened. Um, it does not happen often, uh, but sometimes you have genuine and authentic people. Uh, earlier this year, we were doing a news conference and I saw one TV network's uh, journalist 
um, holding a tripod for another TV network uh, uh, talent. And, and that blew me away. That spirit of cooperation was awesome. Not something you see every day. I certainly commented on it and, and said I thought that was great that they did that. Uh, but most journalists want, most newsrooms want an exclusive. They want to have it first. Uh, they don't want to help out the other guys. That's the spirit of uh, capitalism and competition. And number 11, uh, you've been so helpful that I'm personally going to phone your boss, let him know what an invaluable and indispensable resource you are. This story would have never gotten off the ground without you. That should always be true, but don't expect them to pat you on the back. They're just doing their jobs as are you. And you should definitely maintain that professional relationship and not insist upon uh, anything else. Uh, Chris, are there any questions that we need to uh, move on before we go to your four That's rights and fine. responsibilities? of working with the media. Okay, thanks, Chris. Um, if you do have questions, go ahead and submit them. Chris is standing by, let's put them to work, put them to good work here, and I'm happy to answer, ask me anything, I'm happy to answer it. So working with the media, your rights and responsibilities. So your spokesperson should know their story, right? You should develop three key messages and then supporting statements for each of those key messages. Uh, a pro tip is I like to put them on an index card uh, and keep them at my desk or uh, in front of my phone or in front of me while I'm doing interviews. And then I try to go back to those key messages as frequently as possible, uh, depending on the question that's asked. So use quotable language, action verbs, and full sentences, right? Say the name of your organization, but do so smoothly. Don't do, do such like you're stuffing those words into the conversation and it sounds unnatural. You sound spammy and they probably won't ask you to be back if you are dropping your company name too often. Uh, instead, sell your smarts and expertise. Just kind of talk with authority and, and share your knowledge and your smarts and that'll help people remember your company and who you are anyway. Uh, have a newsworthy theme. As I mentioned, kind of scrub what you're talking about against those 10 elements of news. Uh, those 10 elements of news are not very prominent uh, on the internet. I actually picked those up from the University of Missouri School of Journalism when I was there. Um, and I know I'm speaking to my Mizzou people right now. So M-I-Z to the audience. Um, and, uh, and use each question as an opportunity to develop, deliver a message. So no matter what question you're asked, you've seen politicians do this a lot, they'll be asked about healthcare and instead they'll give an answer about crime or economic policy. Uh, you know, if you can do that well, consider kind of pivoting your answers, but at the same time, don't be disrespectful to the, the question or the interviewer. Um, and and uh, you know, at the same time, you've got to find that balance of getting your message out there. Uh, and so be discriminating and selective, right? Don't overload your story. Don't try to have too many key messages. Uh, be clear and concise, um, coherent, and, uh, you know, I think smart, be smart and be brief. But also be confident. You know your story most likely better than the reporter does. And if you don't, you either need to prep really quick or question whether or not uh, you're the right person to do the interview. The second thing is to consider your audience, right? So we think about the media as an audience, a channel, and a tool. Um, and so, you know, they're not necessarily the ultimate audience, their audience is your ultimate audience and you want to use them as a channel and a tool to reach that audience. Um, so be careful about getting over involved with the reporter's attitude, you know, some attitude, some reporters have in disinterested job. But if you know this reporter well and they start to seem disinterested, you might want to start kind of give them an opportunity to speak up and, and kind of change the direction of what they want. Uh, a quick story is there was a reporter who uh, in the middle of, um, in the middle of uh, our, our pitch, he started kind of yawning like really loud. And, uh, and I think that turns some people off. But for me, I really like that because I got instant feedback and we knew to pivot and, and adjust our pitch a little bit. And it actually ended up working out great. So while he was blunt and bold and maybe even rude by yawning uh, during our pitch, uh, it gave us the wake up call. We needed to know that this wasn't interesting to him. Uh, and so we used our other pitch and it worked like a charm. Uh, you want to avoid a debate or dogfight with the journalist. Um, you know, uh, most of the time you will never experience a hostile news interview, but they do happen. And uh, one of my tips is that when we're doing news uh, in their interviews in person, if that uh, happens uh, in your career, uh, I've learned just to, you know, gently pat or, or touch 
the, the person that's asking you the questions in a way uh, just to kind of humanize yourself and humanize them for a moment so that they realize that you're a human too and uh, you know, you're not an object to be attacked. So, um, and then uh, ask is if you're communicating with a family member, uh, really the intent there is just to speak like you're with familiarity, like you're talking to a family member, but also maybe if needed, kind of dumb it down like you're speaking to a family. messages. So again, kind of three to five, uh, you know, points that you want to make, commit them to memory uh, and return to them whenever possible. Assure the delivery of each message. You don't want to miss out on a key message. You want to naturally uh, get to that message. That involves sometimes some rehearsal. Um, and, and messages should be fluid and you should be able to move through them very smoothly and in a, in a, uh, in, in a logical order. And again, no message is complete without supportive uh, information. So you need examples, anecdotes, uh, and figures and third party endorsements. So you have a key message, then you have supporting points underneath it uh, when and if needed to share. And number four, enhance key messages. So uh, transition and flag your messages. The best thing is this, the important part is this. Uh, there's, uh, raise those messages frequently. And um, let's see, uh, um, and then those messages will vary uh, from outlet to outlet. And you wanna tailor those messages to meet their audience, uh, your audience and the audience of the outlet that you are uh, having a conversation with. And so we have 12 ways to perfect, perfect a print interview, but before we do those, I'm seeing a question here. Um, what should you do if the organization doesn't want to grant an interview? Um, and so, for example, I'm just uh, conjecture here, but let's say the company's under crisis and they're getting requests for interview or there's a scandal going on and they're getting a request for interview. The question is, should you just not return the call? I would say no. Um, if you're, uh, it, and I would consider uh, to this person's question whether or not your job depended on it or your career and reputation depend on it. So if it were me, I would recommend returning the call, thanking them for uh, their inquiry, uh, kind of setting the stage for the environment. You know, hey, we're really slammed right now with a lot of media inquiries or we're being pulled in a lot of directions or we're being told not to speak to the media. So I will get back to you as soon as we can, if we can. Uh, uh, but some kind of statement like that, just to be transparent, just to be proactive um, and set their expectations. You know, hey, I'm probably not going to be able to call you back on this or I can talk to you next week or can I get back to you after five or whatever it might be. But yeah, I mean, you, you want to maintain that relationship of the media relations and of the public relations. Uh, unless for some reason, you know, you feel vulnerable that you might get convinced to say something you shouldn't or, you know, there's some kind of mandate from your company that might get you in trouble. So you have to balance that. But I think your integrity and reputation are of the utmost importance. So the 12 ways to perfect a print interview um, is uh, one, find a suitable location to talk to the reporter, either in person or via phone or in the modern era with Zoom. Um, without interruptions, right? So you want to uh, make sure you don't have, you know, uh, kids or family members running in the background. Uh, you don't want to be in a loud conference room or in a loud hallway or even outside where there's traffic and, uh, and pedestrians. If it's a phone interview, don't use speakerphone, right? You really should try to give the best quality and the best experience for the reporter. Uh, stand up to talk on the phone. Uh, you just sound like you have more authority when you do so uh, than sitting. There's also a technique um, is uh, here before is lean to one side during the call. By leaning to that side, uh, somehow magically you speak with more authority and a better voice. Obviously switch legs for comfort uh, during that time period. Um, and another thing I see people do is they like to end their, their sentences like questions. So they, they start out speaking and then they kind of end on a high note um, as opposed to maintaining a steady voice. And uh, your audience is going to sense a, uh, some insecurities when you speak that way. So try to balance your voice when you, uh, when you do that. And then this is an interesting tip, never take a cold call, right? So, you know, take the call, uh, acknowledge them. Thank you for calling. Uh, can I get back to you in five minutes? Can I get back to you in 30 minutes, an hour, two hours? Whatever is realistic, but I, I never recommend doing an interview cold. I would always come in with your key messages. I would review these slides. I would coach your executive. 
Um, but, you know, journalists are on a deadline, but it doesn't mean you have to stop what you're doing. Even if you just ask for 30 seconds or a minute uh, to regroup, I've used this with much success over the years, and I think you will too. Uh, number six for mastering a print interview, making points handy. We just talked about that. Explain complex information in simple language, avoid jargon, right? And you need to kind of keep it in a soundbite and at a third, maybe fifth grade level, depending on your topic. Listen carefully to each question, mirror the question back. So if they say, you know, uh, how many years has your company been in business? You would answer it with our company's been in business for 15 years. Uh, as opposed to just saying 15 years, right? Give them something they can work with and edit as needed. Um, and if you need the reporter to clarify, just say, hey, could you, could you restate that question or could you ask that another way? I wanna make sure I understand exactly what you're asking. That also gives you a moment to catch your breath and kind of think through the best way to respond. And in a face-to-face -face interview, don't let your guard down, right? Nothing is off the record. Um, even though they're not broadcasting it live, they're still listening to everything you said. Uh, one of our clients at a publicly traded company, a uh, Fortune 500 company, once did an informational interview with a Reuters reporter. And off the cuff, just conversationally before the interview started, um, even though it was only an informational interview, he started off with something pretty provocative. And he said, you know, the people that work for me are typically nerds. They're not well liked publicly, uh, but they're very hardworking, very smart people. And we use their smarts to develop products. Well, that was the lead of the uh, uh, news uh, wired story that was syndicated uh, worldwide. And uh, my client was not very happy when that happened. And without consulting with me, sent a pretty uh, unflattering email to this reporter of whom he had been asking for an interview with since the first day I met him. Uh, he he uh, pedaled back a little bit and um, you know was able, we were able to regroup with that relationship a little bit, but certainly, he did not make our job very easy in doing so. Uh, I've got a question here. How, can you explain information all interviews? And Chris, sorry to put you out of work here, uh, but I'm happy to answer this directly. Thank you for the question. Please keep sending in the questions. Uh, an informal interview, uh, what I meant to say was an informational interview. That's where you're doing an interview without the intent of, of a new story happening, but it, to this point, you're never off the record, so a news story could happen. So sometimes a reporter will be willing, if they have the time, which is not always often, to do a brief informational interview, like a get to know you interview, where they're not expecting to write a story, you're not expecting to write a story. But if you handle this informational interview well, in my experience, almost always a news story comes out of it. But worst case, you're building a relationship for the long term with this person. So the last two tips here on perfecting a, new, a print interview is you keep the ultimate audience in mind. I mentioned this earlier, right? The consumers of this news outlet are your true audience, and you want to use the relationship and the clout and the visibility, credibility, and reach and platform of the news outlet to tell your story. And the 12th one is assess the appropriate language level of the report and the publication and tailor your messaging accordingly. You're going to speak a lot different to a, to, with Science Magazine than you would uh, Reader's Digest. And so think about the audience and speak to that audience through your conversation with the reporter. Chris, before we go on to perfect a quick time check and to see if we have uh, any other questions you've received. No questions at this point, but just keep on going. And I think we'll run a little bit late because uh, we lost you and your internet's been going in and out a little bit, but we've been able to uh, make out what you've been saying. So just keep on going. All right, buddy. Thank you. So perfecting a radio interview, I'm going to also consider, let you consider this as a podcast interview, right? Radio, as the cliche goes, is the theater of the mind. And so you're using radio to create a visual uh, when people can't see visuals. So you let your words and your sound uh, impact that. So general tips, right? Um, radio reporters typically want really short sound bites. Uh, just can envision it, right? Like I mentioned, uh, theater of the mind. Speak slowly and in time. Don't let silence intimidate you. Feel free to pause. Often when you pause, you draw in attention from the listener. Uh, avoid ums and ahs. I think I just made one there. Uh, have your talking points nearby. Uh, since you're not on camera, you can actually keep those print in print and nearby you. 
And again, to transition or highlight a point, say this is really important before you share the important point. Um, again, perfecting a radio interview, avoid background noise. That's really important for audio. Sit up straight and even stand up. It energizes your speech. Uh, behave as if you were on camera. Uh, it'll help you be animated and energetic. And a lot of radio stations, especially when if you come in studio, they've got live feeds going from webcams. So don't forget about that. And smile, right? Although listeners won't see it, you'll be able to hear it. And I think you know what I'm talking about. Um, if not, test it out and see if you can see that in your own voice when you're speaking with others. Uh, perfecting a video interview, the same things apply, but it's just a little bit more unique uh, in the uh, the real pre-interview tips, watch other people being interviewed on TV with the sound off, see what they're doing well, watch the expert TV reporters and take notes of their posture and behavior and their dress, review your notes and talking points before coming into the studio, appear relaxed on camera by doing breathing and stretching exercises for your voice, your mouth and your body right before the interview. A lot of times you can go in a green room and do these activities. Uh, be prepared for the reporter to want background shots of you and your work environment. Never assume the camera isn't recording just because the lights aren't on or you don't see the light. And don't bring more than one person with you in the TV news studio unless you're instructed otherwise. I hit on this earlier. And then nonverbal elements, uh, smile and be animated when appropriate. I tell people if you think that you're smiling too much or you have too much body language or you're, not, you're speaking too fast, uh, you're probably doing, are you speaking too slow? You're probably doing just fine because you're nervous. There's an element of, of, uh, of self-criticism and anxiety. But I think if you're, if you're speaking uh, with the way you're being trained to do so here, you're probably doing just fine. Maintain eye contact with the reporter. Uh, never look directly at the camera unless they tell you otherwise, but you should be having a conversation with that reporter. And it's actually their job to move the, the cameras in a way that they can see you best. Uh, don't watch yourself in the monitor. It's distracting and you're probably not experienced enough to be able to do that well and pull it off smooth. Don't lick your lips, squint, roll your eyes or have excessive blinking and allow your head to move naturally as you speak. Uh, if you're with a host that's ripping you apart, don't, for, uh, don't be afraid to say something or at least work with them a little bit. Try to make it harder for them to be nasty to you. As I mentioned earlier, maybe, you know, maybe touch them in some way appropriately, of course. Uh, maybe just sometimes you just tap them on the hand or something to get that personal touch uh, and kind of bring them back to a little bit of, of reality. The other thing I highly recommend is don't sit in a swivel chair where you're doing swiveling like this during the interview. Um, think in terms of communicating with people in their living rooms, your audience, their audience's audience. Uh, be polite, keep sentences brief, think in sound bites, avoid um, ahs, and okays. Avoid jargon and acronyms. Speak distinctly with your normal voice. Be sure to uh, naturally vary uh, your tone and your pace. Uh, if you don't know the answer, uh, please say so. Just say, hey, I don't know that information, but I'd love to get back to you, or I'd love to get you in touch with the right person who has that information. And then give it a time bound. Say, I can get that information to you by five o'clock today or first thing tomorrow morning. And don't waste times with phrases like, as I mentioned before. Again, they're looking to edit your session down and they need to make sure that they're getting it um, done. Let's see, uh, don't forget your volume at the end of a sentence. Uh, and I mentioned that earlier, like don't peak up in your voice, keep a steady voice. If anything, maybe drop your, your tone lower, not higher. And be careful about popping peas on a microphone uh, because that doesn't typically sound well. And hopefully you pick up when you're doing that, but if not, uh, you know, just try to avoid them. We have another tip that is, or a tip, not a question that has come in. And I think this is a good one. So turn off your cell phone or hand it to someone else during the interview. You don't want to be distracted. You don't want to respond and you don't want to hear uh, a vibration in the background. Uh, I hear that a lot on our podcast. We have a podcast uh, called On Top of PR and sometimes you hear uh, the alerts or whatever. And, and so we stop the podcast because it's pre-recorded and we ask them to turn that off especially the vibration, that's the worst. Uh, posture points, stand up straight, uh, sit on, I'm sorry, sit up straight, sit on your jacket, which seems a little counterintuitive, but it helps the jacket stay nice and flat uh, during your interview. As I mentioned earlier, don't lean or swivel in a chair. 
Uh, if they give you a chair that you can swivel in or you have one, change the chair. Don't let that happen. Uh, keep your feet flat on the ground or cross your legs towards the interviewer. Don't tilt your head to one side. Uh, communicates uncertainty. Remain immobile below the neck. Do not gesture with your hands. Um, when sitting at the desk, lean slightly forward. It shows your interest level and it keeps you focused. It also helps you look a little better on the TV. Um, when standing, place yourself about 12 inches apart, uh, your feet about 12 inches apart, um, and kind of find a natural posture. If we were doing this in person, I would show you a great way to find that natural posture. Uh, there's a great technique that we use. Maybe that's something I can record and share with you later. Um, and then uh, do not lock your knees because we don't want you passing out during that interview. Oh uh, yeah, I got a question here. The name of the podcast is called On Top of PR. You can find that at ontopofpr.com. It's also a vodcast. We do a video recording of it as well. Okay, so appearance matters. Um, you don't want your, so take a look at this guy. You'll see he's wearing a Navy jacket or a black jacket and he's in a black chair or Navy chair. And it just looks like he's wearing incredible shoulder pads. And so uh, one tip that I picked up uh, from another spokesperson trainer was to bring an extra change of clothes to your interview. And the rationale for that is many fold. One is what happens if you spill something, your coffee on your drive? What happens if you show up to the studio and you are dressed just like the host? Or what happens in this background case? So you know, the host will find it flattering that you thought enough ahead of time to bring, or your interviewer to bring a change of clothes. Because while they have a wardrobe there, they probably don't want that inconvenience. And especially if they're going from guest to guest, it'll look awkward if they change their clothes. They probably don't have time to change their clothes, but if you arrived early to the interview, you could pick up on that and pivot quickly. Uh, wear solid colors, uh, a jacket or long sleeve, uh, and a tie in a strong but not distracting color. I, you can see where my pattern is messing up the screen a little bit, at least it is for me. You wouldn't want that to happen to you while you're on TV. So learn from my mistake here today. Uh, be clean shaving unless you have a beard. Keep your hair out of your eyes. Uh, if you do wear a, weird, a, a, a beard, uh, keep it neat and well trimmed. If you're bald or balding like me, you want to put a little powder up here to avoid the shine. I kept the shine here just for you guys today. Um, and uh, keep your jacket buttoned. As I mentioned, sit on the jacket um, and make sure your makeup uh, you use is the same color of your skin. Don't try to be orange or some other color that's not very flattering. Uh, Earpieces. Um, I'm wearing one right now um, and I'm trying to hide it from you guys, but sometimes it shows. Uh, don't touch it unless it falls out. Test the audio levels before starting. Chris and I did that. We should check the internet connection, Chris. We'll do that next time. Um, if you're wearing an earpiece and you lose volume or something goes wrong, just, just try to speak to the producer, quietly state your name and say that you can't hear anything. Uh, the producer will hopefully be able to fix that for you remotely. Post interviews reminders, uh, when the interview is over, sit still until the producer or host tell you you may go and you're done uh, and that you may leave the set. So many times, and I've had this happen with my own clients, it's rare, but it does happen. You see them start to stand up even though they're still mic'd up and they're, uh, you know, or the, and or the, uh, the feed is still live or they're still on camera and they didn't realize it. So just because the person interviewing you is transitioning to another story doesn't mean they've bumped away from you being on video. And if you want to improve your TV performances, watch, review, and critique the entire TV uh, interview within 24 hours of the show airing. And I would say, and keep doing it, um, and then keep practicing. So Jason, we do no, have a question. We, we do have a question uh -huh. regarding battery packs on the, uh, the, like the Sennheiser wireless mics. Well, okay. where's a good place to put those on women or what should you bring if uh, you're, if there's a woman on a dress? I mean, what are you, what is your advice there? Uh, men, it's easy to put in your pocket or on your belt, but uh, what about women? You, so great question, oh, Chris. Um, I wouldn't bring anything uh, equipped. I wouldn't bring anything equipment wise to the interview uh, unless you're concerned about the quality of the interview and then maybe you wouldn't even want to do it. Uh, but, right, equipment, but to your point, pack uh, out of sight and you want to obviously do it in a way that you're comfortable and, prof and, and, and professional doing so. 
uh, I would lean into them and ask their expertise what to do. Um, you know, they are the experts, just like you would ask them, what camera should I look at and follow the instructions that they give you. They're highly experienced with working with professionals that are well-dressed and talent that's well-dressed. So they know how to handle this. Um, if you're working with Chris and you're doing a custom video, of course, you're going to lean on Chris for his expertise. And if you're doing it yourself and you're not sure where to do it in your own recording, uh, maybe that's time to consult an expert like Chris for help with that. Uh, so a comment from Pat. Thanks, Pat. Uh, he's saying a couple of female weathercasters have uh, here in Milwaukee put a band around their knee. I've seen that done a lot as well. Chris? So Jason, what about uh, kind of a talk back situation when you're talking back mm -hmm. with uh, people on the other side, you're the only one there with the, uh, uh, the earpiece and the mic. Um, any suggestions for that? I, I've had to do that numerous times as do a number of us have. So go ahead. Yeah. So um, I think your question is that uh, you're doing a remote or being interviewed remotely uh, and you have your own equipment at that point to be able to participate in the interview. If I'm understanding that correctly, um, uh, you know, you, you again, you want to get there early, like Chris and I connected early and we talked through and we checked the lighting and the sound. You'll want to do the same thing with the producers there and then ask for their advice or, you know, have a trusted colleague or advisor, whether it's your PR counsel, your PR agency or your video production person be there just to make sure it goes really well. Um, you know, I had uh, my friend that is a video producer here in my community. I had him cruise over and help me perfect my podcast, Vodcast Studio, just to make sure it was right and well lit. And, uh, you know, it, it ended up being, a, you know, a couple trips over to make it better every time because uh, we believe in constant improvement and getting 1% better every day. And I think one of the things I wanted to bring to light was uh, I had a client on Fox Business News and uh, essentially they were, they had to go to a local studio to do a talk back with uh, the, the actual right. studio in New York. And essentially, um, when you're, you're on camera, uh, you're on camera, smile uh, and, and understand that you're gonna be smiling for like three minutes beforehand. Uh, you're gonna smile during your interview and you're gonna smile afterwards and continue looking until you get the, uh, basically you're done, um, the, the cut uh, words. So go ahead, Jason. Chris, you're reminding me of one time I had one of my clients, uh, huge billion dollar brand. They were being interviewed on, um, I think it was CNBC or some, or Bloomberg or something like that. And the interview, first of all, we showed up to this production studio and it was their, uh, their, their setup with the network uh, was in a basement. Uh, it was dark. It was not very inviting. And the person did the interview the whole time, just like a deer in the headlights staring and talking very monotone during the interview. It didn't go well until she warmed up a little bit, then she killed it. But because the beginning of the interview was not very good, it took us quite a while to get her back on that network. Um, so yeah, uh, real quick, 10 media interviewing tips and please send in your questions so we can get to those. Um, remember your rights. You may ask the reporter for information that will help you prepare for the interview. You know, ask them what kind of story are you doing? What's the angle? Who else are you interviewing for this? are often impulsive um, and they're seeing it so they may not know all these answers but the more data you can collect for yourself or your spokesperson up front uh, the better the interview will go and the better you can prepare them uh, plan your points and make them early an interview is your but you need to be prepared for it Opposing point of view, so they may have other guests or other sources. The reporter may push back on something you said, which is really good to have your key messages ready. Uh, prepare yourself by knowing the media, right? You've got to know their outlet. Uh, you don't want to misspeak uh, about their outlet. You don't want to share the wrong messages with the wrong audience. If you're doing an interview in St. Louis and it's for, uh, you know, you think it's in St. Louis, but it's really a national story or a Milwaukee story, you want to vary up how you might respond to that. You don't have to know everything. I mean, it's just as simple as that. Don't expect that you're gonna know everything. So be comfortable telling the reporter, I don't know that right now, or I'm not an expert on that, but I can tell you who is. They will appreciate that. So will your company, so you're not misspeaking. Um, I don't know is a legitimate answer, as I said before. So, but make sure somebody gets back to them. Make sure you make an effort to get them the source or the information uh, or the soundbite that they need to meet their deadline. 
Uh, I said this before, be smart and be brief. Keep your messages to a few lines and make your point often. Reporter is not going to know 100 things about your company after one interview, and nor do you want them to. You really want to focus on three, maybe five key messages throughout the interview. Don't overwhelm them. Use language everyone understands. Avoid jargon. Uh, and again, speak to a third or fifth grade level, depending on the outlet. You know, Reader's Digest, again, is going to be a lot different than Scientific America. If someone makes any untrue statements, refute it immediately and politely. So, for example, if you're doing an interview and they say, you know, uh, hey, Jonathan, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Or I'm, you know, I'm here with Jonathan in studio and we're talking about this. And Chris would speak up and say, uh, actually, it's Chris, um, but I'm happy to answer your question. Or, uh, or you could just say, yeah, so, um, yeah, I'm Chris. And the answer to your question is this. Don't try to embarrass the reporter or the interviewer, but certainly make that correction early. If they call your company by the wrong name or they say that you're a, you know, $50 million company and you're a $50 billion company, well, then you clearly want to correct that right away and not let the interview continue because it'll be really awkward if you try to say, oh, and by the way, a few minutes ago when you called me uh, Steve, I'm really Jerry, right? They'll be like, what? Wait a minute. Or they'll say earlier when you said our company is headquartered um, in Kansas City, we're actually headquartered in, in St. Louis. All right, so uh, number 10, don't get lost in statistics and numbers and be boring, right? Uh, use the numbers to your benefit, but don't overly focus on them. So I'm going to open it up to see if there are any more questions. And, and Chris, I, I hope it's okay, but we've offered a, a mentor program here for anybody who likes what they heard today and wants to kind of do an Ask Us Anything session. Uh, we've got this new program we've rolled up. We're pretty excited about it. Somebody here might be interested in it. Uh, but again, we'll open up for any questions. So we did get one uh, here from St. Louis. Uh, basically, it's not necessarily a question, but a statement at this point. Mm -hmm. um, you likely remember the BP disaster or the horizon spill that uh, devastated the Gulf Coast. Um, Absolutely. You do, yeah. Um, let's see. I'm going to get closer to the screen so I can read this. Um, you may recall the BP spokesman CEO, Tony uh, Hayward, uh, was a train wreck in front of the, uh, the media. Um, do you have any tips uh, to address the sensitive uh, situation of spokespersons who um, cannot deliver a message clearly? So I would say if you've got a poor spokesperson in general, it might be time to find someone else to be that spokesperson. And in his case, maybe time to find a different leader altogether. But I digressed outside of my lane of expertise and the topic of today. Uh, I would say the bigger mistake is when somebody is trying to apologize, but they don't seem genuine or authentic about that apology. They don't empathize with the, the situation at hand. Uh, or, and I think we, we either blogged about this recently or we're about to, um, or uh, they lead with you know, their pain and their problem and how difficult it is for them and then start to talk about how it's difficult for those that are truly impacted and affected. So again, your messaging should always be about the other party or the audience that you're speaking to. They don't care about you. They don't want it to be all about you. They get bored with you quickly. So if you're selfish and self-serving, it's not going to come across well. So instead, what I would like you to do is really focus in on the audience you're talking to and empathize with them. So... So another uh, actually question that came from Patrick is, uh, um, how do you help an executive overcome their fear of the media or their um, basically their fear of engaging reporters? Yeah, that's a good one. Thank you for the question and please keep them coming. Uh, so Patrick, uh, in my experience, as I'm sure in yours, um, you know, there's just some people who just don't want to do um, interviews. I've got lots of great contacts and I can't persuade them to come on my podcast. Uh, they just are shy. You know, um, there, there was a book recently written about, you know, the, the shy CEO or the quiet CEO, I think it was called, it was really good. So we were working once with this billion dollar global brand and their CEO was a great spokesperson, so smart and everything else. He just didn't want to do news interviews. And he said, look, I pay you well, so you keep me out of the news and you keep my people in the news. And so we had to identify spokespersons within the organization underneath him. And the only time he did an interview one time in the over a decade we worked with him was uh, for a nonprofit charity that he was chair, chairman of their, uh, of their fundraiser. And he did some media interviews for that. Of course, I really gave him a hard time about that because, you know, I, I said, what's the strategy here versus really doing what's best for your company? Uh, long term. So uh, 
coaching is also the answer, Patrick, and doing this kind of training and practicing those interviews and building their confidence level, maybe throwing them a few low lying interviews or a few simple interviews or doing some role playing interviews, get them on camera with Chris or, or your iPhone and play it back, give them some coaching, spend time with them and build their confidence up through good training and, and, and encouraging words. You know, my kids fell off their bike a few times before they figured out how to do it, but they still kept doing it. So Jason, one of the things that I do actually, if it's a very positive organization, um, is I have a lot of B-roll and a lot of uh, interviews that I put on a thumb drive and actually hand that to the media uh, as uh, sort of additional uh, video or, or stuff that they could use. And a lot of times over the last 10 years, one of my clients, we've done this very successfully. And because they've had some incredible slider reel shots and drone shots and other shots that the, the actual cameraman wouldn't have been able to get, um, a lot of our stories for the Gary Sinise Foundation uh, have been able to go national, not just local. So they're able to package it. So uh, go ahead, Jason. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. So I would say... Um... First of all, yes, genius. I'm glad you're doing that. But don't make the mistake I see people make, which is, you know, put your logo on it or put your graphics on it or make it look, you know, if you're ever making it look like they didn't do it themselves, then they're probably not going to use it. And, and I facepalm all the time because I'll ask a client, hey, go shoot this video, make it raw. Don't do any editing. Don't do it. Don't add any effects to it. And then they send it to us. Of course they did that. And it just blows me away. I'm like, how could we have been more clear about this, right? If it looks polished and fancy, then they're not going to use it. We did a video news release a few years ago. And I went to the production company. I said, look, we got to make this look like it was shot in 20 minutes, you know, by, by the local TV affiliates, not something, you know, world-class and first class. And sure enough, they overproduced it. Sure enough, they wanted to enter it into awards. And I told them, hey, th this is not working. Like it needs to be raw. And, uh, you know, we finally got there, uh, but it took a lot of effort. But I think you're right. It's really smart to be prepared with that B-roll ahead of time, especially in advance of a crisis. So if anything ever happened at one of your facilities, you want to have footage of the inside of your facility and what it looks like or the exterior of your facility, if, especially if you're keeping media out so that they can use that footage if they choose to. So I was working with a chemical company and our recommendation was, man, get in there and, 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 uh, and uh, what do you call it? Scrub the place down, make it look official, make it look like you're sending this video to OSHA and then shoot it, shoot that as B-roll for your upcoming employee and external audience videos. And maybe for the media, we wouldn't want to do that unethically, but obviously you, you would have more control of the situation than you would responding to something. So Jason, the irony about shooting your own video is that when we started doing this about eight years ago, it worked in almost 100% of the media markets except for St. Louis, the media market that we were in because of the union rules and regulations. But because of social media and everyone has a camera now, it, it seems like uh, those uh, rules and regulations regarding unions have been uh, uh, quite a bit laxed here recently. So even in St. Louis, they'll use your footage if it's something that you provide that they're able to use. Well, you know, I love markets that have a local news service um, where, you know, we had this. Uh, so two things we've done with great success uh, is we've had uh, a client who was doing a sweepstakes of all things. And the sweepstakes winner was in Chicago and the other one was in Minneapolis. And people were blown away by how much media coverage we got for that. Well, the secret in Chicago was a local news service that we reached out to that worked for all the TV stations you know, they get paid uh, for the number of stations that pick up the story. So you had two people advocating together. We were advocating for our client. They were advocating for their coverage. Um, and, uh, and that was a real home run. So uh, I was really pleased with that. And uh, that's something that people overlook. And, you know, the power of the iPhone, especially the new iPhone, uh, sounds pretty impressive. And so, you know, early in my career, those things didn't exist. Now there's no excuse to not have those things and to get some basic training on them. But always, always don't overlook involving a professional uh, like Chris and other people on this call, just to make sure that you're doing it to the best of your ability. You're putting a first class production together. Well, great point, Jason. I know Samantha's asking the question, is there a, a typical format that you'd use for TV stations um, uh, if you're going to provide them B-roll or, or interviews? And uh, at this point, a, a lot of news stations will say, even if you get your iPhone, uh, get us footage and we'll try and use it. And that, unless it's the newest iPhone with 4K, I, I mean, that's probably your last resort, uh, but you can try and get it done professionally first. And um, 
if you can't do that, I mean, obviously use your iPhone because uh, you want to get the coverage. Um, and obviously Patrick responded, but uh, Carolyn, I want to answer your question real quick. Is uh, this all great information? Is it going to be, is there going to be a copy of it? And yes, we do put uh, all of our videos, of our webinars on the St. Louis uh, PRSA YouTube page. So all of our previous webinars are on there, at least most of them, and this one will be too. So you can check back on the St. Louis uh, PRSA webinar page. Uh, go ahead, Jason. Well, and, and to that point, thank you. Uh, you know, having a pro like Chris involved, he's gonna be able to edit it where I, uh, I broke out and we, you waited for me to reconnect so that when it's replayed on YouTube, it'll look so much more polished as if I actually had solid internet connection here. Uh, but anyway, uh, to that end, um, Chris, uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, if anybody has any questions, you can certainly reach me. I'm highly accessible, especially on LinkedIn. If you reach out on LinkedIn, though, please make sure you tell me how we're connecting or why we're connecting, i.e., uh, you saw this, uh, this webinar presentation, and uh, I would love to answer any questions you have and, and be a resource to help you and help your spokespeople, uh, because I believe in the power of PR. I believe in uh, enhancing the profession and giving back to it. Well, Jason, thank you so much for being here. I know you're very busy with your agency, and uh, uh, we have so many more webinars coming up that uh, we, we encourage everyone to join. They're free for members or non-members. Uh, there must be something wrong with the internet today because Bridget in Kansas City, who we usually have close out our sessions, um, says that she keeps getting bumped off of uh, the webinar as well. So, uh, I mean, whether it's in Jacksonville uh, or where you're at in, uh, in Florida or in Kansas City, it seems like we're having some issues here as well. So. We want to thank everyone for being with us. Next week, I want to reiterate that uh, we do have a webinar on the 12th, and it's Wake Up Your Writing, Tips to Avoid Tired and Overused Language. On uh, November the 19th, we uh, have Elizabeth Edwards, who's the founder and president of uh, Engagement Science Lab and Volume PR. Her uh, title of her webinar is Mind Blown, The Eye-Opening Science of High Conversion Engagement and then uh, just to reiterate, the last one that we currently have scheduled is December the 3rd on improving team morale and client uh, retention by Shauna Knuckles, who's the founder of uh, Advocation PR. So we have a lot of great people. Again, Jason Mudd's uh, firm, Axia Public Relations, just was named one of uh, Forbes Magazine's top uh, PR firms in the country. So please feel free to reach out to Jason. What's your email address if someone wants to email you directly? So it's J-M-U-D-D -D at A-X-I-A-P-R dot com. So that's jmud at axiapr dot com. And again, I'm on LinkedIn, so you can find me there pretty easily as well. Um, and uh, really looking forward to connecting with the attendees here today. Uh, Chris, thanks again for having me. I was glad to be here. And again, uh, take me up on my offer. I'll be happy to answer any question anybody has um, after this. Well, thanks again, everyone, for joining us. As I usually say what Nora Adano says on the uh, CBS Nightly News, a test negative and stay positive. So join us next week, and we look forward to having you on the next uh, PRSA uh, webinar chapter webinar series. So thanks again for joining us. Have a good one.